Hello and welcome. This is William from PCTE and today I'll be leading our webinar presentation on the location of structural steel in concrete with a particular focus on the comparison between ground penetrating radar systems and cover meter systems. I'm joined today by Stuart. Hello. Who is our Victorian manager. He'll be talking particularly about the GPR topics. I'll be covering the cover meter topics and the introduction. Now, this is something of a sister presentation to our document on the location of structural steel in concrete. And upside down. Yeah. Oh, so I stew. Um, so this particular document is going to be sort of the sister to what we talk about today. It talks a bit more about the appropriate sensitivities of the different tools. Um, and why you might choose one tool over another. It also has a very good summary of the particular benefit of each testing technique. So while we're going to talk a little bit more detail about how the technologies work today, present case studies about getting the best performance from them and discuss the basics of why you choose one device over another, there is more detail in that, in that white paper document. I'll be sending a copy of that to all of our attendees or people who've registered after this presentation, or you'd be quite welcome to jump on our website um, or our recent newsletter, and there should be registration to receive that white paper as well. So I'm gonna share the main screen now. And we can begin our main topic. Now, just to Um, yes, Fernando, the webinar will be available after this point. So the topic today is going to be the location. Now, am I sharing the right screen? Is that coming across with our presentation? Yep. Uh, excellent, Stu. Thank you. I can't, sorry, I can't see the interface has changed. No. So what I'll be talking about today is location of structural steel and concrete. Um, particularly we're going to be covering the reasons you might choose to locate steel and concrete, the detection technologies, and um, also our case studies will be on estimating cover, the location of post-tensioning, so those are both GPR topics. And then for cover meter topics, we'll be talking about the correct measurement, the best measurement procedures you can use, and also the adjustment of the settings to give the best results. So why do you locate steel and concrete? the most common reason to locate rebar tends to be, is it placed where it should be during construction? Um, and the most common reason to locate all embedded steel and concrete tends to be, particularly for people doing concrete cutting work, to safely cut around the reinforcing steel, post-tensioning and other embedded objects in the concrete. Now, for engineers, they may be trying to confirm how a structure is constructed. And for those who build or remediate structures or infrastructure, it may be as input to the construction process itself. To, for example, people installing cathodic protection will often use some form of location tool to ensure their anodes are placed suitably distant to reinforcing steel. Um, or people undergoing new construction may use this to install plumbing or services after construction. Um, finally, cover meters in particular, but radar as well, are often used as input to remediation or corrosion surveys. Um, cover in particular, the importance of concrete cover, the depth of the reinforcing steel from the surface, is that it is the first and best barrier of that steel to the outside world. Steel and concrete have a uh, relationship similar to aluminium and air, where a passive oxide layer is formed on the reinforcing steel cast into concrete. But the outside world is dangerous for this. If salt from a marine environment, chlorides, make it to the level of reinforcing steel, or if carbon dioxide um, on the longer life of a structure, or in an area with additional carbon dioxide like a road tunnel, it, either of these situations can promote corrosion 
in the reinforcing steel. So if the cover is reduced by maybe two to five millimeters, it can actually have a very big change to the expected design life of that structure. This is why cover is such an important thing to measure during the uh, um, during major surveys <coughs> of a structure when it's being built or investigating its any design life. So as I mentioned, there's two particular technologies we'll be discussing today, and that will be ground penetrating radar, um, particularly higher frequency ground penetrating radar like ProSix, GP8000 and GP8800 systems, um, talking about how um, with sensitivity used for concrete scanning. Um, the other technology will be cover meter measurement, um, particularly the majority of cover meters are eddy current, pulsed eddy current measurements. And just to give a very, just the sort of nutshell distinction between the two, ground penetrating radar is a scanning technology. Um, is a ground penetrating radar is a scanning technology. So it will have the ability to locate multiple layers of embedded steel in a structure. Um, it's also sensitive to non-metallic targets, so it could find um, conduits or other targets inside the reinforcing steel and will determine uh, back wall or thickness within the bounds of around a 700 millimeter maximum depth. Uh, comparatively, the eddy current cover meters, their depth is limited to 140 to 150 mils for typical size reinforcing steel. And they are explicitly used to locate reinforcing. They're not sensitive to other forms of embedded steel like post-tensioning. Essentially, other steel acts as a form of interference or other metals act as a form of interference to cover meter technologies. But that said, with the limits on depth, single layer and interference, they are the most precise measurement available for the reinforcing cover depth. So when it is a critical part of the quality assurance of a structure, you will get better measurement from a cover meter. It's actually reasonably common to calibrate depth measurements of a ground penetrating radar with a cover meter. Stuart will discuss that in a second. Um, so just before we launch into our GPR topics, Ian, it's important to keep in the back of your mind what you're assessing when you choose a technology. Is the target going to be reinforcing? What is the maximum range you'd like to work to? the precision of the measurements you need. And if you can't achieve that precision, is there a sensible way to allow for the imprecision of the tool you're using? Again, Stu will discuss that. Um, and also what sort of output you get. Even within cover meters, we have around five or six different models available with different suitabilities. And within radar, there's different options to buy a GPR system. And there's different form factors of those GPRs. So not only do you need to know what you're scanning for, but also how you need to show some of that information or do you need to show some of that information? So keep that in mind as we talk. Now I'm gonna uh, pass the conversation over to Stu while I'll keep running the slides while he talks about ground penetrating radar topics. Yeah, thanks William and hey everyone. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to be here today. As you have questions, uh, just put them in the chat and Will or I will just address them when we can. Really encourage questions and we'll do our best. Um, I'm gonna focus on GPR and I have a number of slides on kind of theory and, and what it looks like, what it can do. And then I just did a couple case studies on common questions that I, that, that I run into with people. So the first is, well, how accurate is GPR? I mean, Location with GPR and cover meter when you find steel is is accurate. Depth, on the other hand, with GPR it's an estimate, but there's things we can do to improve improve on that estimate that I'm going to get into today in one case study. And the other case study is post tensioning. I'm always getting asked, you know, how do I find post tensioning? What would be the method to look for it? So those are my two case studies. Um, on GPR, just taking this slide here and expanding a little bit um, on this graphic. It's a really great technology to find everything that's happening in a concrete slab. We can find multiple layers of reinforcement, post-tensioning, electrical conduit. We can find the bottom of the slab. Basically, anytime we have a change in material, 
the GPR is going to let us know and it's going to tell us where that happened and approximately what depth. And it goes to 700 mil. It's in a cart, so you can cover a large area. And we can also report on site straight to a PDF for our customer with useful information um, quickly. There are some limitations. Um, really dense reinforcement can limit our, the depth and amount of signal that can go through it. Think of it as the more things that you scan through, um, the more it will limit how deep we can go. Uh, we need a contrast between materials. So think if we have two concrete slabs together and, and they're in good contact, there's no change in material. So there, there wouldn't be anything we'd see there. If we have a delamination, then we can pick, we can pick that up as an air gap between the two. Um, fresh concrete can limit um, how deep we can see because of the moisture content and depth is an estimate which I'll get into. We'll go to the next slide. All right, locating embedments. Hope everyone can see this video. Um, it's a huge portion of what we do. Um, it's probably represents 60 to 80% of why we use GPR. Um, we're scanning to locate rebar post-tensioning our services before we drill a hole. Um, I hope this video is playing okay. It looks like it's just kind of hung up a bit on mine. Um, but the embedments could include rebar post-tensioning or services. Um, reporting may or may not be required. More and more, it is required, but GPR systems often come with a tablet now that enable reporting to be done on site. Newer systems as well have 3D scanning capability and augmented reality capability. So this is just an example here of doing a uh, core, core drill. Uh, we're looking for an area in this lab where we have clearance to put a hole. So what we've done, we did a grid scan, scanned all the lines in a 600 by 600 mil area. Um, once that was done, we used augmented reality just to overlay our grid of all the reinforcement on top of the concrete. We can make that transparent and we can just mark on the concrete where we have a gap in reinforcement where we'd like to drill. And once we've marked that, then we're going to grab our core drill here and we're actually just going to drill a hole. Now, this is a bit of a summary of a job. This wouldn't be the only scan an operator would necessarily take, but it's a good example of the job of uh, penetrating through concrete. Just to establish that this is not showing you the one and only and best procedure for locating reinforcing steel. It's just a nice case study. Yep. All right. So I think this is just showing after the hole has been done here, it's just transparent. We can see that we've real, drilled it in the correct spot. Thanks for that. All right, just a bit on theory. Um, we're sending GPR signal into concrete and we're measuring the length of time it takes for that signal to hit targets and come back. When we're approaching, in this case, a uh, steel bar, as we're approaching it, so here, here we'd be scanning perpendicular to the bar. As we approach, the signal travels a greater distance to hit the bar and come back than when it's straight on top of it. And that's why we get that hyperbola shape. That if you're familiar at all with GPR, or if you're not, you will be after, after today. You get these um, hyperbola, these curves. The midpoint at the top is the top of the rebar, and those tails are caused by that uh, greater distance it travels as you're approaching the bar and then running over it. Go to the next slide. All right, so we just got point and line reflectors. A line reflector is just Another way for saying the bottom of the slab. So we would be changing from concrete to soil or concrete to air. We don't get that curve. What we get is a straight line on the bottom of on the bottom of the scan. And that just represents the bottom of the slab. And then we can basically just take take a measurement of the slab at different points along the way to get an estimated depth of our concrete slab. And then the other one we have is a point reflector which would be rebar. As we're scanning along, we keep hitting the rebar and when we're straight over top of it, the signal comes back more quickly and we get this hyperbola shape. And then we also have a, 
which I'll get into later, a migrated view where we take this hyperbola and just put it into a red dot, which is just our, our steel bar. And of course, it's not just a rebar. Um, it's going to be any embedded material that the radar reflects from. Um, the other thing is this is crossed at 90 degrees or approximately 90 degrees to form that classic hyperbolic shape. Yeah, it can also be an electric conduit, non-metal, other things. Um, each material reflects a different amount of the GPR signal back. And that difference is what gives us our, our contrast on a GPR scan. So steel reflects all the signal back. That's why we get really sharp curve, curved objects, those curve we showed you, or, or the red dot on the heat map. And it's also the reason that we can see the bottom of the slab when we change from concrete to soil or concrete to air. <clears throat> That's good. All right. So here's just an example scan. We have a top layer of reinforcement with probably equal spacing around 150 mil uh, for each of those curves. And then we have a straight line around 200 mil, which is just a bottom of the slab. <laughs> yes. So uh, thanks, Matt. Matt just asked if steel fiber um, affects the, the scan. And, and yes, it, it does. So uh, both GPR and cover meter will not will, will not be effective for steel fiber reinforced concrete. You you have to look at an ultrasonic technique such as pundit array, which might be something you can talk about next month in that defects presentation. Well, but uh, yes, that's ultrasonic pulse echo tomography. That's a shear wave technique. Yeah, um, we'll talk about that after the main presentation if you like as well. But we'll stay with the electromagnetic techniques for the moment. All right, um, and then on the right-hand side, oh no, this is fine, keep it here. All right, on the left-hand side is what a GPR scan looks like in grayscale. On the right-hand side is what we call migrated or heat map view. So we take these objects, which are hyperbola on the scan, and we just collapse them into dots, and we get a much more intuitive, easier to read view on the right-hand side. Um, on newer GPRs, it's actually possible you just flick between the two views and you often are confirming your findings on one with the other and getting extra information from each view. Now, Stu, one thing I always like to stress when I show people the difference between migrated and raw GPR data is that the left-hand side view, just like uh, Ben pointed out, that's what the machine sees. That's very close to the raw data. Whenever you migrate or you produce a 3D image or a, a sort of slice view image, you are mathematically processing you, your data. You are removing complexity to make it easier to interpret. So it's great to show to a client, great to uh, present that information. But if you want to read the most information from a scan, that's always going to be in the uh, B-scan data or the raw data from that GPR. So when we say, have a look at both of these topics as you work, it really is important that you compare your migrated to your non-migrated. Sometimes the migrated will show you something that wasn't clear on the raw data, but the raw data is always going to be the easiest one to do things like pick up um, what are real hyperbolic targets and what is maybe a result of the mathematical processing of the migrated view. Yeah, I think you'll find with experienced GPR guys, they use the one on the left when they're doing the work. They might flick a bit to the one on the right just to confirm a few things they've seen. And then when they do the report is when they might use the one on the right just to explain things a bit a bit more clearly. But the one on the left has more information. So if you can get really skilled at interpreting the one on the left, you're, you're going to have more information about everything happening in the concrete. That's good. I'm going to spend some time because I get asked a lot, well, how do I, how do I get a more accurate, you know, depth for these targets? So um, yeah, so sorry. So for most of the images in this, it's in centimeters, just times, 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 it just is in centimeters. So just um, times by 10. That's it. Um, all right. So I want to talk a little bit about how quickly the signal travels in the concrete. So each material has a, 
uh, property called dialectic constant. And the more moisture that you have in concrete, the, the, um, the different your dialectic is going to be. So for GPR, the depth for the, uh, the depth of your targets is affected by the moisture content of the concrete. For cover meters, the cover measurement you get is going to be affected by the amount of steel that, that, you're, that you're measuring in the area. So for cover meters, our challenge is to use some techniques Will will get into to isolate a single bar. For GPR, our challenge is to figure out what the actual dialectic was of the concrete, so how much moisture was in the concrete, to get an accurate depth. Location is always going to be accurate, but depth we can improve on. Here's some measurements for dialectic. You can see concrete ranges from about 5 to 12. Water has a dialectic of 81, which is quite high. So the more water in the concrete, the higher the concrete's dialectic. Okay. We can just guess and say it's about 7 as an average for concrete. If we do that, yeah, we get a depth measurement and, and it's an estimate. We could do ground truthing. So we could go to an area where we actually knew what the thickness was. So if we did a core or we could measure somewhere on the slab to get its actual thickness. Um, and we could use that value to correct our dialectic to be um, act more accurate. Or on a lot of GPRs, um, such as the ProSec GPR and others, they come with an autocal feature, which is, which is better than guessing. But ground truthing is still really what you'd be wanting to do to if you're asked to be as accurate as possible for depth. Here's case study one. I'm just going to get into the details of how to actually get more accurate depths with a GPR. So here's a slab with a top layer of reinforcement equally spaced. And then let's just slab, bottom the slab at about 200 mil. Again, it's centimeters, but we can see it's around 200 mil. Go ahead. Just a quick question from Neil about whether a bond deck or metal decking would affect the reflection of the bottom of the slab, Stu. Yeah, um, so steel actually reflects all the GPR signal back, but because you know, the rebar is small, we are actually seeing around the rebar when we see multiple layers. However, if you had a bond deck slab or a, bond, or a metal plate, basically, if you, when you hit the bond deck, it just reflects all the signal back so you won't be able to see anything below the bond deck. Um, that's the other interesting thing with bond deck is you actually can look like a second layer of rebar because the ribbing of the bond deck coming up can look like point reflectors. So um, if you do have a bond deck slab, you may have a flat metal surface visible, but it's equally likely to look like a reasonably deep second layer of reinforcing. But everything above the bond deck will be, will be fine. We just won't, we won't see past, we won't see past it. Yeah. Um, in this scan I did, I just started with an estimate of seven for dialectic, which would be average for concrete. And I just hit somewhere on the screen. I brought up a crosshair. I found a bar at 1.12 meters from where I started. And my depth estimate was around 102 millimeters. That's not the best way to pick a point because you have this red dot, or on the left-hand side, you have a white, a black, and a white line. So where within that dot is actually the change from concrete to steel? We can bring up an A scan. We just basically slide, slide our finger over, uh, and we get the A scan view. And where we have a peak is where we've changed from concrete to steel. So what I'll do is just move that crosshair so it's on the peak of the A scan, and I know I'm at that change from concrete to steel. And I'm still using a dialectic of seven, but I'm picking a better point for where I actually think I've changed materials. Now we're going to get into ground truthing. So I've moved down to the bottom of the slab, 
and it's telling me that the slab's 211 mil thick in this scan. But I actually know it's 180 mil because there was an area of the of the slab that I could physically measure as 180. So what I need to do is change that dialectic so that the bottom of that slab is correct. So when you're when you're picking a point, you want to you want to pick where the peak is in the A scan. That's where you've changed material. All right. So here's ground truthing. So there's three ways to do it. Pick an area you can see the thickness of the slab. You could take a core to confirm the thickness, or you could take a cover meter, which is accurate to typically plus or minus one mil, and use that for the top layer of reinforcement to get an actual measurement of something. In this case, I could see the slab was 180 mil thick at one point. So I left my crosshair on the bottom of the slab. And then I adjusted the dialectic from seven up to 9.7, and that changed my slab thickness to be 180, which was correct. You don't need to do this all the time because location is always accurate for all of my reinforcement. However, if you have a job where you're asked to use a GPR to give you the best possible depth measurement, you need, you need to do one of these methods. So you, you either need to guess, you need to ground truth, or on the next slide, you have to do uh, like an autocal method. So on ground truthing, now that I know my dialectics 9.7, I use that for the rest of of my scan and I can click on any point. So in this case, I've gone back to the top layer of reinforcement and now it's told me that it's 81 mil. Okay. That's a much better estimate than just guessing what the dialectic was. This is the AutoCal. So I bring up this yellow curve. I fit the curvature of that yellow one to the actual hyperbola. And then it gives me a pretty good estimate for what that dialectic was. And I don't need to do a core. Now, Stu, just a few questions from the chat. Yeah. Um, the first question was, we see a parabola when we cross a reinforcing bar perpendicular. The question was, what will we see if the rebar is parallel to the GPR's movement direction? Oh, in that case, uh, you'd be running over top of the bar. So uh, the distance the GPR would travel to hit it would always be the same. So you'd get a straight line. Um, the second question was uh, about taking the depth measurements from the black band. Um, the, if I may, the basic one there is you do need to be consistent. Stu is here using the energy peak um, from the A scan to pick his depths, and he's calibrating that depth and then reading the other depths from that lower down. Um, it's sometimes more appropriate to take the first strong top band, but it most important to be consistent. Um, the other thing is if you can see the reflection from the concrete from the radar entering the slab in your raw data, so that's at the very top at zero, you can place in the same band for the best point to start your depth from, uh, Julianne. Okay, I think we're good to keep going, Stu. Okay, so AutoCal is better than just guessing at seven. Ground truthing is, is better again but maybe, maybe more difficult if there's no, if you don't have a cover meter or there's nowhere that you can just measure and they don't want to do a core, okay. All right, case study two is just a little bit about identifying and locating post-tensioning. So post-tensioning is really distinct. Um, they're larger and flatter targets than rebar. Um, they usually appear beneath or instead of rebar and they, sag in the slab moving from tension zones so the first time you find them you know close to an edge they're going to be closer to the surface and then they're going to move down and then come up again also they're irregularly spaced so with rebar you know every 150 mil you're expecting another one with post tensioning you might have a bundle together and then one nothing for a meter and then another bundle of post tensioning strands so those are some of the key things that we're looking for when we're scanning. We 
want to start with a visual survey of the structure and consult any as builds we have. This is basically just for any scanning that we do. We want to go around, try to understand how the structure was probably built, use any tools we have available or that were provided and ask questions. Proposed tensioning, our key signals are grout tubes, tensioning hardware pans or staples. We want to scan over or close to columns or beams. Um, that'll allow us to find the post tensioning at the top of the slab. With newer GPR systems allowing us to go deeper to 700 mil, if we did start mid-span, we, we would still expect to pick up the post tensioning, but it's going to be a stronger reflection if it's closer to the surface. So this is still a good method to follow. Yeah, one of the universal rules of any kind of serve, uh, NDT work is um, just because you haven't found something you expect doesn't mean it's not there. It means that it may not have been found by your hardware. So you do need to, when there's something you didn't see, get back to a place that may be easy to see. So that's why we say getting close to the columns where you might expect your reinforcement to be close to the surface and easy to locate, especially if you're not able to see it, um, say in the mid-span of a beam where it could be quite deep, maybe below that 700 meter threshold. And as I said, the, the depth is going to depend upon the moisture content of that concrete that you can go to. So always look for the things you expect. And if you don't find them, that's an important time to see, maybe look elsewhere rather than just take it for granted. Yeah, it's easier to pick out when the scan's long because the post-tensioning strands could be a meter apart from each other. I would also say just for all GPR scanning, you don't want to do one little scan. You want to, especially when you start a job, you want to do a whole bunch of scanning in the area just to get a feel for, for what's in the concrete. Um, and for post-tensioning, long scans are better. Um, reinforcing, you know, it'll be typical 150 mil spacing and the post-tensioning we'll see it intermittently. Once we've kind of identified where we think we found post-tensioning, we want to do a series of parallel cuts because if we can find what we think is a post-tensioning strand multiple times, like along the path of it, and dropping in depth, which is what we expect with post-tensioning for it to sag, then we can confirm that, that, is, that that's the post-tensioning. So here we are, we're doing a number of multiple cuts and you can see in the scans below that the post-tensioning starts at the top and then gets deeper along, along the mid-span and then comes up again. Once we've done a couple markings on that post-tensioning and confirmed, yeah, it is a post-tensioning strand, then on the next, on the next uh, one here, we can actually just go straight over top of the post-tensioning post strand and, and see it dip and come back up again. Um, and demonstrate that sag to confirm what it is. Um, PT tendons and ducts are larger and wider than rebar. So they tend to be a different shape and uh, something that sticks out like pretty clearly when, when you see them, especially once you've scanned it multiple times. Okay. That's, that's, pretty, that, that's pretty much the basics of it. So, yeah. So, Stu, one more question uh, from James at ALS. It's, if we're considering rebar has diameter in the range of 10 to 36 mil, does GPR show the depth of the top of the rebar or does it show the depth of the center of the rebar? Oh, it's the top. So it's where it changed from uh, concrete to steel. Right, thanks, Stu. Um, is that everything you'd like to present on radar for the moment? Is there any other comments you'd like to make before we move on to cover meters? I'll just give everyone a chance to add a final question at all. Right. Yes, please, in the chat box, or if you'd like to unmute and ask, go ahead. All right. Thanks for your time, everyone. I'll pass it to Will. No problem. We'll have a chance for some more questions at the end as well. So I'm going to be talking about cover measurement theory and also procedures. So um, as Stu's covered, the depth on a radar survey it, it's an estimate. We can get it pretty good with uh, activities like ground truthing, where we've got access to the information. But the depth of a cover, me a cover meter is a measurement, provided we give it the right information and we follow the right procedures. So just to talk about the sensitivities, just like we did with the GPR, your cover meter is limited to the first 
150 mils of the reinfor of the structure and it is explicitly used to locate steel conventional reinforcing bars it's not going to locate non-metallics like a uh, like a glass fiber or carbon fiber rebar um, it's not going to correctly locate embedded metals uh, other than reinforcing bars because those will act more as a source of interference than as a uh, target for the cover meter. Now, they do have the most accurate cover depth measurement available, provided you set them up right. And they also offer a diameter estimation function. And I want to be very explicit about it being an estimation function. It's not a number you want to take and put into a report with plus or minus one millimeters. It's just not appropriate to do that. But if you are combining some cover meter estimates with destructive investigation to confirm the size of the reinforcing bars, it may be appropriate to back it up a little bit, but don't use it as your absolute only tool. Um, but there is, that is a measurement that radar does not offer. There's no information on a radar scan, um, at least in my opinion, on the size of the reinforcing bars. The hyperbola shapes don't change with diameter of steel or diameter of target. Um, and while some GP operators choose to try and find the top of reinforcing bars that may be in contact, the lack of precision inherently, five mils, 10 mils uncertainty on the position, depth position on a rebar scan and the fact that you're picking depths by eye on the scans and picking the tops in each case, I don't think it's going to give you a uh, particularly reliable precision. I don't like to suggest it as a technique, um, though I do acknowledge that I'm not the one and only master of GPR or cover meter surveys. Um, now, the a key limitation of the cover meters is it's only picking up the top reinforcing. If you had two layers of rebar, even within the measurement depth of the cover meter, it's going to be a source of interference. It's not going to find what's happening on the second layer. Um, and by layer of rebar, I mean horizontal and vertical or uh, longitudinal and transverse bars. Um, so one cage, not a, not a single layer of bars in one direction. You will get the bars in the other direction, provided you pick the right spot to measure from. Um, now, Ben, uh, now I'm going to go straight into technology, Ben, so give me a second, but they're not using radio waves um, or microwaves. They're actually using a different principle. Um, now, the other particular limit is cover meters are affected by any reinforcing steel reinforcing steel or other metals in their field of survey so we'll t i'll show you some diagrams that show what that field is but if you've got metal close together and you haven't used some form of adjustment with your cover meter you're going to under represent the thickness you're going to your cover will be thinner than otherwise so coming straight on to the technology gpr is pulsed eddy current so there is a electromagnetic coil or a set of electromagnetic coils in the probe of your cover meter. Um, and that probe is going to produce a alternating current electromagnetic field, which is going to in turn induce an alternating current in the reinforcing steel the current flowing through the reinforcing steel produces its own electromagnetic field. So by turning off the measurement on, the cover, uh, on that field, we can then determine the signal strength of the pulsed eddy current induced field. And that's what cover meters measure. They're essentially a sensor in a box that determines a signal strength due to any metal near to that probe. And by giving it information on the expected diameter of the reinforcing bars, you're able to get very precise measurements under the assumption you have only a single reinforcing steel bar in, uh, in the mag electromagnetic field of your cover meter. Just to represent that in one way, another way, we'll produce a pass current through the coil, it will produce an electromagnetic field, which will induce current into the reinforcing steel. And that will produce its matched electromagnetic field, the strength of which will be measured by a second receiving electromagnetic coil. Um, and by essentially comparing diameters of reinforcing bar expected 
to signal strength received, you have depth. Now we have Julianne Latham asking, if the bar diameter is unknown, how significantly can this affect the accuracy of the depth measurement if it's incorrectly set? Now, I don't have slides in this presentation that go into deep analysis of precision, um, but a couple of key things to keep in mind is that it is more affected close to the surface. So if you've got a very thin cover, 10, 20, 30 mils, a slight variation in reinforcing bar is going to make a big difference. The effect of being a little bit wrong in your bar diameter is reduced the deeper the overall cover. Um, the other thing is if you look in the manuals of the Profometer or Profoscope cover meters, there's actually a wonderful diagram that shows you the additional uncertainty you would add to your measurements if you go from say a 16 mil bar. Let's say you enter a 16 mil bar and you're unsure if you've got a 25 or a 12, you could actually work out and include in your reporting work the additional imprecision your, your lack of knowledge gives. Now, ideally, you can break down and have a look at a reinforcing steel bar. What, one thing you should not do is use the estimate functions to try and enter it. It's better to um, either use knowledge of how the structure is constructed to choose reinforcing steel um, sizes when you don't know it, or to physically investigate the size of the reinforcing steel. Um, one other key point of interference with this kind of measurement is, is if you have a welded mesh, it will cause more signal to return than conventionally constructed uh, rebar layouts where it has been tied together. So if your measurements seem to be out um, over from what you expect, and it's you know, something like a slab on ground where the reinforcing is really only there for crack control, it might be that you've got a welded mesh which will really throw out diameter estimates and will have an effect on your uh, thickness measurements as well. Um, now, the welded mesh is going to reduce depth or uh, on the, co the, the cover. It's not going to increase it, the additional electromagnetic signal. So you get a big change by moving the steel bar closer or further away, and you get a fairly small change by changing the diameter at the same height. This is why, the diam this is why diameter estimates are an estimate, but cover depth measurement is a measurement with the cover meters. Now, um, I do have more detailed presentations on cover meter limitations. If you would be interested in hearing about that, get in touch by email or um, with your local manager and we can set up a private session to go through some of that. But that's the basic news is it is important to have the right diameter set. Um, small differences change your uncertainty, um, but you're still reasonably good, but very thin covers have an effect and welded mesh will have an effect. Now I've got, I can see that I've got a number of GPR questions in the backlog as well. I will be going through those. Um, in fact, we've got a break point now, so maybe I can quickly just go through those. Um, Stu, are you good to jump back in? Yeah, sure. Okay. So do you need a flat surface for the GPR was the first question? Uh, no, it's got four wheels, but if one wheel is turning, they all do. So as long as, uh, yeah, as, as long as you can keep one wheel in good contact, you're gonna get accurate locations for now, I actually also really like the GP8800 model. That's a compact palm antenna style for curved surfaces. Um, and if I had a really rough surface, like an exposed aggregate, you could lay uh, something like a plastic core flute or a non-conductive material over the top. You won't get quite as good uh, signal with the GPR. It wouldn't really affect your cover meter measurements at all, um, just to give that those wheels a flat surface to turn on. Um, it's actually anything which has a wheel uses that wheel as an encoder to see how far it's traveled. So you've got to keep those wheels turning smooth and then you can measure with either system. Um, the next question that I had was from Julian. Oh, sorry, well, I'll, I'll just add as well with the cover meter, if it was a rough surface, you could put wood or plastic mm -hmm. on top or something. And, and there's even a setting in the cover meter where you tell it how thick that was. Yeah, we'll get to that at the yeah. end of one of my case oh, studies. Good. No, no problem, no problem. Um, another one was how easy is it to identify defects such as cracks using GPR? You can find really, I mean, really big defects will change the way that the concrete looks in the scan. But small defects or cracks or hairline cracks or these kind of things, you rarely, you, you'd rarely notice. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have a question from Alex Chu, that, but I'd actually like to cover that one in the, at the, after the completion of the presentation. It's quite a detailed question. Um, now, we do have one question about locating 
disbondment between carbon fiber strengthening on the concrete surface and the concrete using GPR? Would that be appropriate? So again, sorry, Alex, I'll come back to your question, but it's just going to be a bit of a more involved answer. So that was the question about dis debondment. That is, if you could answer that one, Stu, with using GPR to find debonded carbon fiber strengthening. Uh, might pass that to you, Will. Uh, essentially, debonding, delamination in general is not going to be visible with your GPRs. A small air separation in between two materials doesn't change the response to a uh, GPR very much at all. Now, if you've got enough air there, like a void form, a polystyrene void form, or an open void, it's quite easy to find those layers with a radar. But just fine delamination between carbon fiber and concrete, or within uh, concrete, like with the expansive corrosion of reinforcing steel, you're not going to pick that up very effectively with GPR unless it's quite pronounced. Um, and I wouldn't try and do it for the carbon fiber rule. I'd use some form of sonic test for delamination. Nearly every sonic or seismic survey technique is absolutely excellent at finding delamination. Um, now, a couple more cover meter questions. We had will welded, uh, if the mesh is only locational tack welded and not proper 50 millimeter long welds, will that still affect it so much? I actually don't know the answer to that. The, uh, what I'd suggest if you, is you could experiment a bit. Um, and to add to Nat Cox above, we have, if we have fully welded 60 mil bar cage, how much would affect that affect the cover measure as opposed to a tied cage? Now, in both of those circumstances, the procedure would be to actually set up a mock-up and adjust your cover meters to give a, a correct measurement for that environment. You've got adjustments, particularly with the prof meter cover meter, where you can give it a calibration setting. You can say, we know this is 50 mil down, please set up my settings to measure correctly. And when you've got something more complicated than a uh, conventional single layer of reinforcing steel, um, it's very useful to use those calibration settings. We'll come to that in one of my case studies. But once you have something which makes it more difficult, you need to be taking some measures to adjust your machinery. Um, so let's go about procedure. Now this particular video is just showing a past version of myself looking at just the basic procedure for measuring depth to reinforcing steel. Um, now, there's slightly difference in the reinforcing bar sizes here too, but you can see that I'm sliding my cover meter from the side over to my measurement point. That's the first critical thing to do with cover meter probes. You don't place them on the surface and read the number off. You will possibly not be over the top of a reinforcing bar. Whereas if you slide your cover meter, you're going to approach the center points um, of the bar as we're coming to now, be able to quickly nab the middle and read off the cover depth. In that case, that was 70 mils cover depth. Um, that's the diameter estimate function. Got it right in that case, but that's because the reinforcing steel was very separate to all other steel. Now, the measurement point on a proposcope cover meter is actually the small crosshair located near to my thumb. So that's, where, that's why I've got that in the middle between the two reinforcing steel, rather than centering the machine itself. You should always know where on your probes the, uh, cut the machines do measure. So on a profometer, that is usually centered on your midpoint line on the probe here in the standard and extended the long measurement range of a profometer probe. There is a spot measurement mode, um, which I won't go into detail for, but its center point is measured at the closed circle um, towards the top of the probe. The open circle is the regular measurement point on a profometer probe. On a proposcope probe, you measure um, in the crosshair, which is normally under your hand, below the screen, below the buttons. Um, the other point on this slide is that we consider the electromagnetic field on a cover meter to be around 150 millimeters from that center probe in all directions. So if you have additional reinforcing steel or other metal um, close to your measurement point within that 150 mil sphere, you will need to use some form of adjustment to correctly measure. If it's a simple geometric correction, um, you would be able to use neighboring rebar correction. If it's a more complex layout, um, the prof meter in particular offers you some calibration settings you can adjust. Now, the procedure to measure cover, we don't know where the reinforcing steel is in a structure in most cases. We haven't, if we've taken a, if we, it's rare you'd do a GPR scan before you use a cover meter. So we need to use the cover meter to find where the bars are 
and pick the best measurement points on those bars to get an accurate uh, rebar depth measurement, a cover depth measurement. So the procedure is first, we want to work out where our longitudinal or transverse bars have lower cover. Um, yes, uh, Nat, uh, if you have your reinforcing bars too close together, so they're, you've got more than one reinforcing bar in the electromagnetic field of the cover meter, that would be an apparently thinner cover. Uh, sorry, so let me continue with the procedure. First, the operator just quickly checks to find if the longitudinal or transverse bars or horizontal or vertical bars are closer to the operator. And then the bar that is closest to the surface, the lowest cover, we scan over that and we mark its position a couple of times. So we know the layout of the bars in that direction. At this point, we are not recording cover depth measurements because we haven't set up our machine and we haven't got our layout yet. We can then pass the measurement point of our probe in between those bars. Um, if those bars were more than 150 mils distant, you could then record those lower bars, the bars with more cover, um, and, and use those as actual cover depth measurements. We can also join those up. So now we've marked the whole reinforcing layout on the surface. Um, after that, we can then go back and pick an appropriate measurement point for our critical cover measurement, which is the bars closest to the surface with the lowest cover. And we can record our cover depth of those. If we don't know where our bars are, it's very easy to pick a point across uh, where you've got the crossing bars. So this procedure should always be your backup. Um, the other thing is by locating the bars, you'll also know the distance between them as part of your procedures. So you'll know to use your neighboring bar correction or your other techniques for correction after the survey. Now, if this was a very critical cover survey and it was, for example, uh, for a input to a durability analysis, there is often also scope to confirm that your cover meter is reading your cover depths correctly after following this procedure. Um, with any NDT technique, the a couple of points of destructive testing can really back up well um, a report for critical matters. Um, but with this procedure, um, you should have a very good cover depth measurement. Um, if you know the bars, it should be an excellent cover depth measurement, the, the damage of the bars. Um, and maybe there's scope to do destructive uh, investigation to get that bar depth and to confirm the function of your cover meter where the job is absolutely critical. Um, and this is universal on any uh, NDT technique is you can really um, sort of become, make it almost a certainty if you've got some destructive evidence to back up your non-destructive evidence. Now, a couple of points of what's safe to do and what isn't. Ideally, you have a single reinforcing bar within the field of your cover meter or you have a single reinforcing bar with um, parallel or perpendicular bars further than 150 mils from the center. At those points, you need to make no further adjustment to your cover meter. If you have parallel bars closer than 150 mils, but your perpendicular bars are still sufficiently distant, you can use your neighboring rebar correction. Um, if you've got perpendicular bars, the profometer also has a neighboring rebar correction for those as well. You've got quite a lot of adjustment on a profometer. The proposcope is limited to a single assumed spacing between both layers of uh, both directions of bar. If you have lapped reinforcing bars, you will read an artificially thin cover depth. This is quite important. That's why you, when you survey a wall or a floor or a structure, there will always be regions where it becomes more difficult to locate the position of bars with the cover meter and the bars all seem like they're much closer to the surface than everywhere else. What's likely happening is this is where one layer of reinforcing bars, say vertical bars, are overlapping a second layer of reinforcing bars. So you've got additional metal. Um, the process if you have inconsistently spaced bars is, uh, Casey, is going to be marking them up on the surface. So you can isolate individual bars with consistent spacings around them to get those critical cover depth measurements. If the goal is what's our lowest cover, you want to be able to measure at various places over your survey element, a isolated bar closest to the surface, because that's gonna be the accurate measurement. Um, if you have 
um, very closely spaced inconsistent bars everywhere, but you know your rebar cage construction, there's also scope to use a set of calibration values for particular points on that. So quite common would be in a precast segment like a super T or something, you may choose to um, have three survey locations because you, um, based upon the drawing construction that you'll set up cover meter values for and measure them on. Does that help? It's essentially, it's all about removing the uncertainty. And when you can't, having some way to address that uncertainty. Um, the other sources, of course, uh, keep away from perpendicular bars, whether they're above or below the, uh, the, reinfor the uh, bars to which you're measuring. You want to be as much as possible isolating a single bar. Now, a couple of other considerations is do try and work out orientation. So you don't really want to only do one longitudinal and one perpendicular scan. It's not quite enough information, just like with a GPR survey where a single measurement isn't going to tell you the whole story. You want to mark the position of the reinforcing bars several times just to make sure they're all tracking in the same direction if you're using that to set up your measurements. Um, secondly, where it's complex, it is very helpful to review the drawings or maybe even bring out a radar system so you know the clear regions and you know the less clear regions. Um, and for example, in this situation, there's several places where it's quite appropriate to use a cover meter to establish the depth of the reinforcing steel. Um, these regions being reasonably consistent spacing, um, this region being far enough distant, even though there's lapped reinforcing bars, um, similar here. And even here where there's bars close together with a consistent spacing. Um, Albert's asked, could you please elaborate on distance from traditional mild steel historic Rio and high strength Rio as not always known what is in the concrete? Um, the response to the cover meter is primarily based upon the conductivity. Um, we assume there's little difference in the settings you would use with the cover meter, but like everything else, that's an assumption. If you think that it's going to be a source of interference or difficulty, or if you've experienced that maybe your cover values are slightly off because the diameters you're entering aren't quite matching up to your historical reinforcing bar, then it may be appropriate to destructively confirm a depth or use some mock-up pieces of the lower strength view, or if you've got access to some, to come up with the very best settings for that kind of reinforcing steel, um, which is what I mean when, when you've got a complex job, you should uh, use some physical evidence to set the machines up. So I was actually just about to go to adjustments. So this is a good, good point to segue across. So the main adjustment you have on a profoscope cover meter is neighboring rebar correction. It's this signal here indicates that it's turned on number three or this signal here. Um, and you enter into that when you've got in the, in the profoscope settings, 130 mils or less reinforcing bar spacing. So that spaces between bars, which you are measuring to, you enter that in the profoscope and um, and that adjusts values. It's uh, an alternative to having a close signal probe. Now on the profometer, you have more capacity to make adjustments. So you have an artificial intelligence neighboring rebar correction function. The artificial intelligence allows you to roll your scan car over top of several reinforcing bars and it will average the space between them and use that as the spacing. And you can do that in two directions. The second function is cover calibration. Now, cover calibration actually allows you to go to a known depth of reinforcing steel of any particular construction and use that to calibrate. So, as I said, this is great for things like precast applications. You can go across an anti-burst cage where there's lots of steel, but if you've got a drilled confirmation or even before casting, you could calibrate the cover measurement of that detail and then come back to the same detail after the reinforce, after the concrete is cast and take your cover dips with a calibration function. Um, cover offset allows you to remove space from the face of the probe. Um, so if let's say we had that exposed aggregate surface and we want to lay a five millimeter plastic board across the surface to remove that offset, the cover offset lets us do that. Um, this is also a good point um, to talk about um, things you, you can't adjust for. So again, 
steel fiber reinforced concrete is going to stop the function of both rebars and cover meter. And yes, uh, Damien, that is a half cell. So the profit meter cover meter can be upgraded with a profit meter corrosion accessory. So it can do cover measurement and half cell potential survey um, or corrosion mapping on the same machine. Um, it's very common to combine cover measurements with um, half cell potential. So there's the capability to do both. Um, there's also some great data logging on the profit meter. If you want to see the output of the data logging, take a look at the white paper I'm going to send you all at the completion of today's presentation because that does have some outputs from these machines. Um, the other thing is, we talked about with rebar, how the moisture content affects your cover depth measurement or your depth measurements on a ground penetrating radar. Cover meters are not affected by moisture content. So they can even be used underwater or on freshly cast concrete. So I'm gonna finish the screen share for now. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending our webinar. Now, um, quickly, before I finish, there was one remaining question which I wasn't able to get to. Um, but Stu, if you could jump in as well. Um, it's a case study GPR scanning done on sulfuric chamber room from top slab. First layer can be seen clearly. Second layer may be damaged or corroded with sulfur layer deposited on the slab soffit. Can GPR, det GPR detective rebar is corroded badly? And how precise is GPR for determining the back wall thickness? So that would be, I think, the spacing between the reinforcing bars and the bottom of the slab. Back wall is going to give a good estimate. Corrosion, uh, you, you may find that there's papers that say, you know, that the hyperbola would appear differently if they were corroded, it would be, uh, you know, larger. But Will is really the better one to comment on that yeah. because I, I've kind of heard it's not really an accepted tool for doing that. So there is a, there's a couple of explicit circumstances where GPR is used to assess general degradation of concrete structures, including the effect of corrosion. Um, there's an American standard. I, I do apologize. I've forgotten the exact number, but it is a um, standard for using GPR to establish the condition of concrete slab, usually with asphalt topping based upon amplitude of signal strength. So the response of a radar to degradation of concrete structures, including expansive corrosion, additional moisture contents at the level of the reinforcing bar, um, the salts, the combined effect is you can have regions with stronger signals where their slab is undegraded and weaker signals where the slab is degraded. Um, the, I much prefer to look through the American standards and use that to compare average to specific amplitudes of signal reflections for degradation of rebar or degradations of slabs. Um, though it is possible for skilled operators to read that by eye to some degree, essentially look for weaker signals and changes in depth due to poor regions on quite a large survey area. You couldn't scan two meters and go, that rebar is corroded. It's not really practical. But with large data sets and some uh, numerical analysis of signal strength and some statistical work, there are procedures that are appropriate. Does that sort of go a bit further for you, Stu? Yeah, no, that was great. Thanks, Will. Okay. Oh, thanks, Face. Um, now, Ben. Hey, uh, hey, STMD 6432.19. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ben, yeah, so there, I do have some people who are operating cover meters and GPR systems together. They primarily use the cover meter to set up depths on their GPR, or some of them use it as a to give those rebar diameter estimates. Um, though I always do explain to them very firmly that it is an estimate, but it's still sometimes useful information. Um, now there are a range of different cover meters I've talked about today. Um, coming back on some of my slides, one second. Come all the way back to the beginning. So here we can see I have on this screen, three different cover meters. I have a profoscope and a profometer cover meter. Those are both pulsed eddy current cover meters. So they are used for the same job, but the profometer has very powerful data logging. It can produce um, data very similar to a B scan or a grid scan or C scan of GPR data, but with the precision of depth of a cover meter survey. Um, so that's why you'd, you'd pick that one in particular is you want to show someone a very detailed um, result 
on the profit meter, where the profit scope gets more used commonly for simple layouts or cross checks. Um, the other thing, the profit scope does have a data logging function, but I call it a table of values function. So that means that it only sort of gives you, we took 100 measurements, the average cover depth was 60 mil, and we had results between 40 and uh, 65. So profit meter is chosen primarily for better data logging, and also those um, adjustments that I showed you, but you have more options on a profit meter system. Um, the other cover meter here is a borehole probe cover meter, which is a very simple device used by people installing cathode, sorry, anodes for cathodic protection. They need to know that they're distant to reinforcing steel, and they need to know it's clear all the way down the hole, so this can, can be passed down the hole. Um, and obviously the GPR, you can choose based upon where you need to pass your GPR. Now, thank you, Ivan, for the commentary. That's, um, is there any more questions? Have I covered all your questions? I apologize if I missed one. So please post it again if I haven't answered because I'm running about, I've got a, it's like I'm in the control system with the space shuttle here. So I may not have seen everything. Uh, and yeah, thanks Ian uh, for that. Uh, glad you're enjoying the, the GPR and thank, thanks Peter and thanks for everybody for their time, you know, and, and great questions throughout. Can I give us any insight into the GS8000? Well, tomorrow I, I can. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. I'll be up at 11 o'clock tonight to watch that. It's going to be good fun. Yeah. I'm really excited, actually. Um, okay, so the two different GPR that I've got visible on the screen now, the one in the lower is Prosex um, GP8000 model. This is the model which we've used as the basis for a lot of our presentation today. It has a maximum depth range of about 700 mils. It's a step frequency continuous wave antenna, which means it has a little bit of additional performance compared to pulsed GPRs. Um, both Prosec systems connect straight to an iPad tablet. Now the GS8000 is the one on the right hand side here. That is also the same antenna technology, but it's a smaller antenna. It has more high frequency content. It probably has an even sharper, clearer image for shallow reinforcing, but your depth limits are maybe 500 mils for the GS8800 model. I've had great luck using the GS8800 as a tool to locate deep reinforcing in pile foundations. Um, but it's very common that's a job that needs to be done with GPR. The cover meters don't quite cut it. And the GS8800 is, is really great for rolling over a curved surface. It also fits into tiny places. It's a very capable GPR, but it just doesn't have quite the same depth as the GS8000. Um, the other distinct feature between the two is the GS, sorry, the GP8000 is going to have a built-in passive power cable detector, which the GS8800 does not have the space for. Yeah, and I'll just add, like, both those fall into a concrete GPR scanner. That's correct. Then the other common one is a utility, utility GPR scanner, which we're expecting to learn a lot more about tonight um, from ProSec. Thank you so much. So um, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you all today, and thank you so much for your help in this webinar, Stuart. Our next one's going to be presenting on um, some defect location and ultrasound, so I'm looking forward to that. But um, wait a few days for me to upload the recording video, and you can go through it again or pass it through to your colleagues, and I'm going to send everyone at the same time a white paper document goes into a bit more detail about everything we discussed, and it's sort of the other side of this presentation. But for now, goodbye from GP... Goodbye from PCTE and uh, the team in New South Wales. See you guys. Bye now.